Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Neil and this is Zach um, and we're Anderson. We are a new music discovery tool that uses audio analysis to allow industry executives to search for new music based on percentage likeness. So be it a label executive or someone working in publishing or marketing, looking for new music that sounds at least 70% similar to Beyonce. Uh, you can hop on Anderson as a recruitment tool for your services. Worth saying that we, um, unlike a lot of music tech platforms, are by industry for industry. Um, myself and Neil are, uh, and Korok actually, are, are musicians by passion. Uh, and myself and Neil are uh, managers first and foremost that's sort of the was the impetus for uh, Anderson when I moved to Dublin from New York finding artists was incredibly taxing um, incredibly inefficient um, there were static databases that relied on user tagging which was biased so we'd find girl groups that say they sounded like Cozier um, and clearly they didn't so I turned to Neil bleary eyed one night and said, man, why can't we change this? Why can't we automate this? And why can't we make it based on sound? Um, so in that regard, we're quite fortunate uh, to have years and years of music industry experience behind us. And Korok as the head of audio analysis uh, who knows his, his stuff down pat. Uh, so Neil and I is sort of had the idea um, but the best I can code is a rectangle. So uh, Korok uh, is really the one to thank for it. Absolutely. And I think it was, it was important for us, or certainly been important to the industry that we are coming at it from music industry stance, uh, because a lot of the pitfalls that music tech has fallen into has been music tech built by techies rather than people who understand how the technology works within that ecosystem. Um, and yeah, like I think, I think maybe the first question I might ask you, Zach, is whether, and uh, it is sort of an open question, but whether technology as a whole has been good or bad for the industry. Um, I, I think it's been both. Um, you know, from a from a consumer pace, facing point of view, I love that when I was twelve, I could download Baby one more time, and it only took you know two hours and forty seven minutes using an AOL CD and. Uh, Napster wasn't illegal yet, so um, thanks to them and, and thanks Brittany. But um, on, the, on the more recent side and, and on the industry side, what it's done is created a lot of false data. Um, it's created sort of this data overload where um, predictive modeling is being used for making decisions that was once made by a guy going to uh, uh, a concert hall and seeing a band and saying, yeah, these guys have it. Now that's to be expected given the breadth of music and the accessibility that streaming's created, but still you have so much data coming at you um, and data that doesn't necessarily um, relate to anything. So uh, for instance, like um, a, a musician could have a hundred million streams on Spotify, which is amazing but that 100 million streams could come because they were featured in a coffee house playlist that was played in every Starbucks around the world. Exactly. Now for them, that's great, but it doesn't equate to loyalty and it doesn't equate to tickets sold and continued engagement. Um, yeah, it's that sort of passive engagement uh, possibility. Exactly, exactly. Uh Again, sort of, it's it's important then to to say that age old of the the one percent of artists are the ones that are really profiting. Um, so of those two million artists in Spotify, only 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 one percent of them are actually earning a living. Um, and when that when that comes again down to like consumer facing products like streaming, the issue is the these streaming services are now seeing as they're at mass, they're making more money than ever their focus is now on personalization and optimization, creating all of their models are based off user behavior. But if you're presenting 1%, you're just going to be basically be sitting in this churn cycle, which people are realizing now. And um, it's why 
you, uh, consumers are noticing the likes of Discovery uh, are becoming less and less. Uh, come here, so no, come on, no, stay in here. <laughs> um, are becoming less and less useful as a, a woman. Oh, there we go. <laughs> are becoming less and less useful as these products get to scale. Um, and in areas like rights management, uh, which labels are losing tens of millions on every year. Um, th th it's, an, it's another area uh, these large organizations are looking to try and fix and their current models aren't working. Um, and we believe, uh, which is the sort of ethos of Anderson, uh, this is because there's no audio driven solution. Um, and the reason why we built this was because what we believe matters most is the music. And ultimately, that's what everything comes back down to. Um, so th th that's that's our hypothesis. Exactly. And um, as you guys can see, this is just a snapshot of um, analytics tools that are currently used across all aspects of the industry. So ones that you are familiar with, I'm sure, are the, the bottom five or six. Indify is a platform for uh, independent musicians. Um, but the top two lines are standbys that are used across the board uh, throughout the industry. So things like Ames, Musio, and Cyanite are uh, directly related to audio. But things like Instrumental, Sodatone, and Chartmetric are platforms that are industry stalwarts. But go back to sort of what I was saying earlier, they give you potentially misleading and either way, way too much data. Um, and so for decision making purposes, I mean, Neil, maybe you can talk a little bit about why it's so important to sort of make the right decision at the right time, <clears throat> excuse me, time using some of these. Yeah, um, like one of the, I think chart matrix is a great example because it is effectively a spreadsheet and for discovery uh, a tool like that may not be beneficial or regardless it's going to be confusing so you're presented with all these graphs however when you're looking at monitoring and um, these large data tools like instrumental and soda tone for the major labels when they have releases already out there are very very beneficial because the data that they do scrub and manage um, allows you to make much better informed decisions. Um, when you're looking at stuff like auto and warm around, again, this is that rights management radio monitoring piece, which is trying to connect the dots in what this data chasm has been created with digital music. Um, one that's not on here that I love um, because everyone here knows what it is, is Shazam. Shazam is, to many people, just that tool you use when you don't know what the song is. But for labels, uh, when you get a song synced on a movie, Shazam is your monitoring tool that tells you how effective that sync was. Has it been, how many times have people interacted with the movie and being like, I want to know what that song is. Um, so again, I think, I think the issue with the fact that we have this data explosion in the music industry is not that it happened, it's that all these solutions arrived to an industry that was slow at adapting new technologies and initially reluctant. And now it, what's important is not to say there's one tool exists, because there's not, there's many, but it's important to know what tool to use and when. Exactly. And uh, uh, sorry, Neil, what was the, how did the industry react to you coming and saying, you know, there's a new way of doing this. What was the initial pushback? Um, I remember, I actually remember our first conversation really well when we had our prototype. And we were, uh, we were going around talking to industry colleagues we know, and then we managed to get in a meeting with like Universal Music in Ireland. And a &R is sort of a touchy subject because some people love it and some people hate it, but by and large, the whole industry knows it's a big time and money waster. And um, so we sat down with the head of the label there and they were like, if you can build this platform that saves us all these headaches, we want it. Um, so that was our first interaction. 
I think it would be naive to say that it's been that easy since. Um, it isn't because we're introducing something new. So when you're introducing a new technology, there is a large adoption phase. Um, come for me. But, but around that, it's like we have, we do have active users uh, from every element of the industry across the UK, Ireland, the US, and a few global agencies as well. As well. What we're now doing as we're learning and growing is implementing new features that make that onboarding process easier and more useful for them, but also learning on how we can adapt our technology to work within the systems they're already using and um, so that that introductory phase is as easy as possible. I think the nicest thing has been growing into and with the industry. So we launched um, just over a year ago with our sort of MVP MVP. Uh, at Ireland Music Week, uh, and then again, two weeks later in Mondo, New York. And what that did was allow us to get about 500 artists on the platform and somewhere between, you know, 50 and 80 industry as true beta testers. And um, it confirmed for me and Neil that what we built was absolutely perfect and needed absolutely no tweaking whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, so we spent the next six months doing all of that, not tweaking and not updating and not changing um, and relaunched again in, in June. And I think the thought that we put in to that, to that tweak and to that growth um, has made a lot of the industry really receptive to it because it, it involved them directly, mm -hmm. which was really, really nice. For sure. And um maybe just to uh, start to bring in the, the real brains in this organization. Uh, certainly, depending on the day of the week, I think it's me, but, um, but really, really, <laughs> it is, it is Korok, uh, our head of audio, um, who leads that whole audio analysis department. So we have obviously people who work directly with our interface, with our platform, making sure it all slots in, but also we've got data scientists as well involved in that process. So I don't know, Korak, if you want to hop in and, and uh, introduce yourself and give a bit of a background to, to who you are and what you've done before, Anderson. Uh, sure. Thanks very much for those very kind words. Um, so yeah, hello everyone, I'm Korak on um, and I head up the audio analysis effort here at Anderson. Um, and the guys gave you a great introduction there in the context and what we're doing. Um, and uh, I was, before I moved back to Ireland, I was based in Berlin and the guys uh, reached out to me on LinkedIn and was very, very curious at that time when they did reach out to me because they're one of the few music tech companies working in Ireland. Um, and it so happened that at the same time, I, I wanted to move back to Ireland as well. So uh, great things came together. So um, I'm here like nearly a year now um, and it's just been a fantastic journey so far with them. Um, and just going a bit back to my my experience and why these guys were, were interested in hiring me. Um, so especially with, a, with an application like this, um, where you're dealing with computer science, where you're dealing with music technology, um, where you're dealing with machine learning, um, it's not just, it's not sufficient just to hire data scientists for, for, for a role like this. You need a very multidisciplinary and multifaceted team. Um, which I do believe we have. I mean, the, uh, the guys there, they have a background in music uh, management um, and are, are, are finding their way with the technology uh, very quickly. Uh, we also have a data scientist team. Um, we, have a, we have DevOps, we have a very strong marketing team. And um, my background uh, from early on, I studied computer science and um, at the time, I didn't really know about, uh, I was also a musician as well, and I was going to study music. Um, but I wasn't really aware at the time that there was all these courses in music technology. So I did computer scientists, uh, computer science, at the behest of my parents, uh, so that I could actually get a job. Um, and after I finished up that, uh, I moved to Dublin, I studied music and media technologies in Trinity. Um, and after that, I worked as an audio engineer for a couple of years at Microsoft, who at the time, um, led and managed their audio lo localization for their Xbox games in Dublin. Um, so I did that for three years, worked on a load of games with that, um, especially around the time at the launch of the Kinect. 
Uh, and then after three years, uh, Microsoft does what Microsoft does. They, uh, they closed down the um, localization effort in Dublin, moved everything back to Seattle. Um, so I said, okay, right, that's enough of that. Um, and I moved to Barcelona, uh, went back to college um, and I did my PhD in computer music. And in this department in Barcelona, in Pompeo Fabra, the university, um, they do a lot of uh, very industry leading work in the area of music information retrieval. Um, which I'll talk more about uh, as we go through the slides here on the deck. Um, but basically music information retrieval is a very specialized information retrieval aspect where we're trying to extract meaningful information from music. Um, and that's very much at the core of what, what Anderson is, right? We have all this music and we want to extract information whether we want to understand this. So going back to what I said, you need a, a very multidisciplinary set of skills for that. So you need to First of all, and uh, first and foremost, which is a lot of companies forget this, is that you need to have a really strong understanding of the music. You need have to have a really strong understanding of musicology, how music works, um, and all that, and all that kind of thing. How audio works, how signals work, and then you can start looking at the data science. Um, and I feel uh, a lot of companies miss this bit. They start diving into the data science first. They start diving into machine learning without any real understanding of what makes music works. Uh, what makes music work, what makes it tick. Um, and that's kind of where music information retrieval comes in because we have a, a very um, uh, formalized and well uh, researched um, state of the art for understanding music using computers. Sorry, I'm waffling on a bit there. Oh no, I think uh, I actually still remember the day that we uh, had our first conversation in the car, me and Zach were driving through. To, to put it mildly, the back arse of nowhere. And I remember that because uh, there was interruptions every time you went into a tunnel. <laughs> it wasn't a tunnel. I think it was a uh, uh, like, of trees. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it was, it, was very, um, it was very comforting knowing that you had that background, first of all, in music. I think that's something we, we love, love to have in Anderson, that, that everyone involved does have that background in music. And not um, only that, uh, we have our data scientist, a young data science, scientist who is from India and his, uh, his passion is cricket. Uh, yeah. And we had to train him up quite quickly with music theory. So the guys were, uh, took him for classes every, every week uh, doing an introduction to music theory. Uh, and he's, he's caught up quite a bit now. He has, he has. Um, yeah, so maybe, maybe we'll talk a little bit then more in depth of the application of I guess and and hopefully this isn't a, a, isn't too scary to everyone because I know it's a big uh, big graph. But what we have on the bottom is music information retrieval and how that filters up into applications for consumers, industry, and artists, which are spanning around the sites. And um, so maybe Cora, do you want to talk a little bit about the complicated stuff, and then me and Zach will fill in all the easy bits. Absolutely. Um... So at the core of our application, um, we try and recommend and discover new artists and new unsigned and undiscovered artists. Um, and this very much falls in a kind of research in, in machine learning and um, information systems all about uh, building recommenders. And we build a recommender uh, that focuses solely on audio. So many recommendation systems uh, like you would have on like Amazon, like you would have on Netflix, uh, would firstly uh, adopt a, a kind of a collaborative filtering approach whereby, okay, if your friends like these, uh, if people who are close in taste to you, like such as your friends or um, who, who've recommended kind of similar things or chosen similar things in the past, it's going to increase the likelihood that uh, you're going to be recommended these uh, new items in the future. So it's very much a social-based, um, very much a user-based um, uh, model for recommending new items. Uh, based on past behavior. Um, and there's two problems with this. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it, it can be biased. It's obviously very, very biased towards the preferences in your past and the preferences um, of your peers and popularity, right? So popular items are gonna um, have more chance of, of being recommended. And this leaves a whole, uh, a whole load of uh, possibly very interesting items at the very end of this that aren't popular and this problem is known as kind of the long tail, right? So populations are going to keep getting uh, recommended. And there's a whole whole 
mountain of uh, uh, unpopular items that just haven't been discovered yet waiting to kind of uh, trickle up into those recommendations. Another problem is also uh, the, the idea of cold start and cold start is, is a huge problem in, in, in um, machine learning systems uh, that rely on history and rely on past behavior. So how do you build an app, from, uh, uh, how do you build a recommendation system like ours from scratch when we don't have uh, history, when we don't have uh, the artist yet, now that we do have loads and loads of artists, over 14,000 tracks on the system, um, we can start to analyze past behavior on that. But um, rather than kind of uh, building up that history and waiting for that history and uh, user behavior to, to rise, we make our recommendations based on the content alone. And another nice side effect of uh, um, basing our recommendations on the audio content alone, as opposed to social and user behavior, is that it eliminates a lot of bias and the bias that uh, the guys were, were talking about there that is uh, very prevalent when you have human a &R people who have their own music musical preferences and they might be pushing on uh, getting older um, and uh, their music preferences is from a different era and then maybe they aren't um, in tune with what the music that's uh, coming out at the moment. So we focus on the audio alone and if, if you look down um, at, it's quite hard to see on the yellow here but we have a whole lot of different aspects of music, um, a whole lot of um, uh, musical uh, timbre and signal processing elements that we, we analyze and that we extract meaningful features from to help us make our comparisons. And these include things like genre, like mood, like melody. Um, timbre is really, really, really important when you're comparing audio. So um, timbre is best described as if we have like, uh, uh, the same note or somebody is singing the same note or uh, and two instruments are playing the same sound, how does the human actually uh, discriminate them and uh, say that one is a violin, one is the vocal, one is um, piano, for example. So timbre is very, very, very important in how we, how we extract meaningful information from these signals. And then we have other things like uh, chord progressions um, and we can go into the semantic analysis of, of things like lyrics and stuff like that. And we, 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 we do a lot of data science, data science stuff on this. But the important thing is we start off with this very, very uh, well understood musicological knowledge and then start feeding that into our, into our data, data science pipelines. Yeah, I was about to say uh, when, uh, when we finish up sprint reviews, it's always pipeline, pipeline, pipeline. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think maybe I'll uh, poor old Zach's been very quiet there for a while, but I might just touch quickly on artists and then pass it over to you, Zach. Sure. I think what's important when we do pass that up to an artist's perspective, um, what it means first and foremost is, again, you're being discovered on your art. Uh, you're not being discovered on how many likes you have on Twitter. You're not being discovered on whether you're trending or not on TikTok. You're being discovered because of your music that you've created. Um, it also feeds back into into you. So when you're getting this unbiased feedback, um, you can choose to or not innovate on the feedback you're receiving. So you might hear that you're you're getting your you think you're heading in one direction, but actually what's being perceived is something else. And when you don't have a team around you and you don't have management or label support already around you, that can be really great unbiased feedback um, that you're getting and can help you to grow further. Um, so on a, on, a, on a holistic level, um, we really believe that providing that audio analysis feedback to artists is, is beneficial uh, beyond discovery. Absolutely. And focusing, I think, on developing the aspects of, of audio analysis that Korak touched on, um, for us certainly is is a very good strategy to enable um companies to use technology like ours to predict trends not based on socials but based on the way music is going uh, so the number of rock musicians for instance or the number of uh metal artists that mention uh, waterfalls um, and and knowing that metal music about waterfalls is on the up. Uh, but it also allows us to create um, this ecosystem that is audio driven 
but having the technology and expanding on it and evolving it also allows defensive IP strategies, which is great because since this sort of has applications across every vertical in the music business, um, there's real competition here. So for things like uh, streaming providers, Neil said it, it goes to that optimization and personalization whereby if you're listening to more music that you like and it's newer music that you like, you're gonna stay on platform longer, which is basically what they want anyway. That's the only thing that these DSPs want is for you to listen longer. Um, but if you get into sort of the nittier grittier stuff, um, you know, as a, as a discovery platform, if you discover a band early when they don't have millions of streams on, on Spotify and millions of followers on, on TikTok, um, you get them for, for a lot cheaper than if you had to battle three labels for them. Um, so earlier discovery essentially create, re, sorry, essentially uh, creates um, a faster, bigger return on investment. And then if you're looking into rights management and publishing and distribution, the automated detection that comes with uh, having discrete features analyzed is completely unwaivable scientific proof that a song was played in this place at this time or is X percent similar to this song that you think may infringe on another. Um, and then of course the, the most fun is uh, the pay-per-click and sort of consumer facing applications that uh, specifically Anderson can offer with this likeness comparison. So for something like uh, phone karaoke, you could uh, pay a dollar to hear how much you don't sound like Beyonce after you've just belted out, you know, single ladies. Um, <laughs> And that all then feeds back into the consumer, right? Because at the end of the day, the consumer is the end stakeholder and everything is being done for better or worse uh, to get them on the line. So for artists, by making music that, art, that uh, your consumer wants to hear, it leads to bigger loyalty. Um, and that sort of feeds back into the feedback loop. Um, for the consumer based on streaming or anything like that, if you know that Spotify provides you cutting edge music that you like and you can sort of have the badge of the, I heard it first, you're going to remain loyal to Spotify knowing that uh, they are on the cutting edge with you. And across the board then it's increased usage, it's increased engagement, it's more tickets sold, things like that. Yeah, so we might as well uh, grill a little bit more in deep in depth to uh, exactly what we do. And and again, I'm going to pass over to uh, the real brains, the operation. Um, don't give away the secret sauce, though. We'll be we'll be muting you if you do. Yeah, um, thanks very much. So, well, basically, when when we think about the whole um, interaction and how users engage with the platform. Um, when you use the Anderson app, whether it be on mobile or whether it be on desktop, um, we make the distinction between the Anderson application and then the analysis engine, which is this API that we have sitting behind us doing all these, uh, all the, the grunt work and all the hard work of analyzing the audio, making the recommendations and returning these recommendations to the user. So on a very basic level, when, when a user uploads uh, audio onto the Anderson app, um, it will also kick off um, our analysis um, procedures. So firstly, we bring in the audio. And uh, one of the challenges we found when we were looking at uh, this myriad audio from all, all sorts of undiscovered and unsigned artists, um, compared to when it goes up to Spotify, for example, is there, there, there's a great discrepancy in, in how like the audio is uh, produced. So thankfully, like the standard is very high. Um, and we, we've discovered uh, that the standard is very, very high from our uh, up recent uploaded competition where we ran a, ran a sound writing competition. And the quality of production across the board is very, very, very high. But sometimes you get people who have, haven't mastered their audio, um, uh, for example, or they've, they've mixed it to quite quite a good standard, but they haven't mastered it up to an appropriate level. Um, or maybe it's a couple of demos, they haven't had a chance to mix that properly or whatever. So you have this, you have a, a discrepancy between, between very, very high quality uh, mastered and produced audio, uh, audio that is mixed, but maybe not uh, mastered and not at, at an appropriate uh, loudness level that you would expect from like uh, 
uh, commercial music. And then you might have some demos and stuff like that, which hasn't really even been mixed uh, that, that well yet. But, you know, the, the content is good. The songs are good, but maybe the, the audio quality isn't isn't there yet and that's fine um so we run everything through like a mastering stage ourselves to get it up to like a consistent uh, loudness level um uh quite comparable to the, the loudness levels that you would hear in spotify when audio is pushed on, put on spotify so they, this gets us on a very kind of even playing field um in terms of loudness um that, that would give us uh, an effective way to analyze these signals um, across the board um then what we do is we um, we, we will focus on a, on a very, very specific part of the song. Um, so we'll, we'll try and pinpoint the most active part of that song or the most exciting part of that song. And this usually kind of um, ties in with like chorus detection. We want to find out uh, like the big chorus of the song or um, where the, the, the climax of the song is or where the most energy is. Um, and you kind of be very used to this anyway, uh, if you like, if you've uh, used any like music stores like Amazon or if you've used uh, like iTunes and things like that, where you buy music and you get this like 30 second preview, um, which is like usually the most, the best representative part of the song. So we also need to do that in order to make, a, we want to give everyone a fair chance. So we try and find the best part of their song in order to make the comparisons um, more effectively. So that's stage one, we bring in the audio, we check that it's clean, we check that it's the right format. We, we do a little mastering ourselves and then we find like uh, a representative part, which is around maybe 30 seconds to a minute long. Um, and then we get to work on extracting uh, loads and loads of features. And what are features? Well, they're, they're, they're the musical facets of the audio signal um, uh, that we use to understand it and that we can use to make the comparisons. And we have a picture of this like machine learning kind of uh, neural connection and brain here. And that's basically what humans do all the time, right? When we're, when we're listening uh, to something, um, on a very basic level, or, or the little hairs uh, in, in, our, in our membranes, in our, in our ears, are getting tingled at certain frequencies. Um, and then our neural uh, network inside our brain is like processing that and converting them into more high level information that we, that we uh, use to figure out, well, that's Bruce Dixon playing on the radio. Um, so very much like how a human processes uh, music and audio information on, um, on a multi-stage level, going from very low level to very high level, we do something uh, remarkably similar, right? Um, we start at a very low level, we extract things like the energy of the signal, how loud it is um, overall, um, uh, over the whole track. Um, and, you know, th this feature alone, energy, is a very, very useful descriptor in like comparing genre. Um, so for example, classical has a lot of dynamic range and the, the energy might be very quiet and then might um, um, get quite loud towards uh, uh, um, the end of the piece. Uh, jazz music can be quite uh, can be quite can be quiet or it can be loud. Um, rock music and heavy metal and like uh, chart music is just consistently quite loud across the board. And there's a reason for this. The, if you have loud music, it's going to get uh, noticed more on, on chart radio. Um, there's a very classic uh, example uh, years ago when when uh, what's the story Morning Glory by Oasis came out. And it was one of the loudest albums uh, uh, in history at, the, at that point. It was louder than Metallica, it was louder than Megadeth, it was louder, it was incredibly loud. Uh, for, for an album that had a lot of acoustic songs in it, for example. And the reason, there was a reason for that was that uh, um, they just wanted to get noticed. They wanted to be, uh, they wanted to be heard. And it, there's a, very, a brute force way of doing that is just to make your music louder. Um, so we extract loudness. Um, we'll extract information about the spectral signal, so like the, the difference whether it's there's a lot of low frequency in the signal or whether there's a lot of high frequency in the signal. Um, so you can imagine like hip hop would have a lot of activation on the low frequency of the scale, very bassy music, very exaggerated bass type music. Um, whereas I don't know, like uh, choral music or Irish traditional music would have a lot more activation in the upper frequencies. Um, so these would be the very low level uh, features that we extract. Um, and then we start moving up into mid-level, so we might uh, get estimation on the BPM or the tempo. Um, so BPM is a very, very important descriptor in discriminating between uh, uh, like classical, which might be slower, uh, but it can also be fast, um, as opposed to like maybe techno or um, house music, which is very kind of consistent around like 120 BPM to 130 BPM. Um, and then we might, we might take some information like the pitch content, what the key is, uh, whether it's major or minor, 
And these we kind of uh, term like mid-level musical features. And then we combine that and all that information. We can shove that into machine learning models and try and predict like semantic information uh, that users say about tracks. Okay, so if we're listening to the track and we go, oh yeah, the vocal and that I can, yeah, it's, it's a male singer. Oh yeah, um, it sounds quite rocky. Um, the mood is a bit sad. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of activity in the track, right? So these kind of semantic descriptors and these natural language descriptors that humans use, um, but that machines don't really understand until we train them. So we, we, we give them a whole lot of examples saying like, this is happy, this is sad, this is rock music, uh, this is a male singer, this is a female singer. And then we put that into our deep learning, uh, into our deep learning uh, um, processes, and then we train models that can extract this high level information. So from a holistic point of view, step two here, where we extract all these features, um, we're, we're going from low level to mid level to high level. And this gives us a massive dimension, uh, multi-dimensional space um, uh, with many, like for example, uh, the timbre or timbre uh, feature would, would have maybe 13 to 26 uh, dimensions, depending on, 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 on what we're extracting. Um, so we, we, uh, we have about maybe 250 more uh, data points per track um, that, we use to, that we use to make the comparisons. And then when, once we have that, we can actually start making the recommendations. Um, and basically, in order to drive these recommendations, we start with a target track or a track that we're trying to um, determine the similarity of. And we use the features from that target track and we very quickly compare that against all the other tracks in our database for which we have features. Um, and we do uh, a distance in that and we get the distance of that, we invert that, and then we order and get the percentage of similarities. And these recommendations then go back to the user. Um, and what I've, what I've explained there is the analysis engine in action for uh, the Anderson application and the Anderson uh, mobile app. This API- um, Just a question, th th those 250 data points you mentioned, do you expose those over API? Uh, some of them so we do. So, okay. okay, sorry, just so, sorry for interrupting. Just a no question. Worries. No worries, good question. Some of them we do and we're, we're uh, so a lot of those data points uh, kind of only make sense to the machine. Um, so we're in the process at the moment of building. Uh, so uh, thanks for raising the question because that leads us quite nicely into uh, the next thing. So the technology that we're using for is we've, we've applied this to the Amazon application, but this API is very, very versatile. And we have a lot of interest in using the API in other applications, anywhere that you need some sort of understanding of your music collection and audio collection in order to drive similarities and understanding of it. Uh, so, that's where I was coming from, yeah. Yeah, so we're in the process the of the API. Um, and, but those the features that we're exposing, we're, it, it requires a bit of work in, in, in figuring out which features we want to expose to the user. And that makes sense to the user rather than like we might have some very, very low level uh, signal processing features that are kind of useless for the user unless they really know what they're doing. Exactly. So yeah, um, I might just touch on that real quickly. So we obviously have our mobile app, which uh, plays across uh, iOS, Android. Um, so that's been live and in market since June. Um, and we're noticing that that's a really good marketplace for artists. So one of the functionalities we have in platform is to allow artists to artist collaboration. Um, it was something that we included as a feature uh, at the gate but we weren't expecting it to be as successful as it has been. Uh, nice to say that we've been receiving messages continuously over the last few months with artists meeting each other on platform. And some of them are going to be releasing uh, releases after having met each other uh, on platform uh, in the new year. We also have web platform, which is useful for upload uh, for artists because a lot of them will store their high quality files on desktop. Um, as well as for industry search, uh, because nobody wants to get caught by their boss uh, playing around on their phone. Uh, API integration is a really interesting element for uh, the beginning of the new year for us, because as Cork mentioned, the applications of our API goes far beyond music discovery. And Zach yeah. touched on this as well. Um, so be that catalog management, as well as looking at large music man management systems like the likes of Sync Tank, who service large scale uh, databases globally. 
Um, fun stuff, like Zach mentioned, in things like pay-per-click uh, usages in consumer-facing products like karaoke, but also the diversity of our API allows us to service things like streaming. So that if they are looking at servicing recommendations to their services, they can do that through our API as well. Um, it is out there, it is being tested and used currently. Um, but as Korok said, because we do so much um, over the next few months, we really are looking at honing in and, and building out what's most important to our clients. Um, maybe Zach, you want to touch without beating a dead horse too much. Um, no, so so just to to go into it, um, I think you get you guys can read at what's on the screen. Korok, I know you've been saying for months that I need to change the yellow on the white, and I am uh, finally in agreement because I can't read that at all. Uh, oh. <laughs> but um, again, sort of the main verticals being discovery, streaming. Uh, rights management and and mobile karaoke and other pay per clicks and and I think what's important here is to recognize the market sizes and how vast they are uh, but how disparate they are as well right so market size for streaming as I'm sure we can imagine is is the highest right uh, it's it's the most widely used um, it's the it's the biggest chunk of all of these. So at a, at a market size of just over $19 billion, the opportunity for optimizing that and increasing that by using music uh, analysis is massive. So if we look at it from the discovery and sync side, which sort of ties into that because all of these streaming platforms have uh, contracts and conditions put in place with every uh, record label under the sun. If the discovery uh, market is a $5 billion market, and they use this discovery to increase that potentially by about 40%, which is the amount of money that can be saved by a label, for instance, using Anderson. If we then convert that over to streaming, you're looking at a massive yearly revenue increase. Um, on the other side, you're looking at a huge save on the rights management side where litigation can be cut in half and uh, sort of the tracking of plays um, can be much better monitored. So the, the uh, BBC just sort of admitted that it processed 13 or I'm sorry, that the uh, British Phonographic Institute processed 13 trillion performances last year. So that's everything from radio plays, streams, uh, and live live gigs. And millions and millions of those were, were uh, left by the wayside and fell through the cracks. Um, so the market there is really more of a preventive one than, um, than an interactive one. Um, and I think that's the, the biggest takeaway from how the markets are affected by focusing on the technology. Definitely. Um, and yeah, not to sing our praises too much, but it's been a really big year for us um, and one we're really, really proud of. Um, so we launched formally back in June um, and it's been really amazing since we've got industry across every major music market using it um, from the highest level execs to small management clients. Um, we have, as Cora alluded, there's uh, over 14,000 tracks on the Anderson database. Um, and that's again, only really gathered since June. Um, and beyond that, again, it's, it's, it's nice uh, getting that user feedback. Cora also mentioned we ran a song contest this year for all users as a way to give back to, the, give back to the music community, which culminates in a live performance in February. So any of you guys who are music fans and want to see some of the talent uh, that Anderson has on its platform, uh, keep an eye in the new year. We'll be streaming that concert in February. Um, I believe you had some good news as well today. Uh, oh yeah, we also might as well mention it. We just got a, announced as a, a national uh, shortlisted for Best Emerging Tech in the National Startup Awards. So, uh, some congratulations, guys. Well done. Congrats, Evelyn. Thanks. Thank you.
Thanks, Mill. So it's, it's been a good year, but um, we're keen to not rest on our laurels and make sure that this API services as many elements of the music industry as possible, especially while uh, we're living in such a digitally focused world. Um, but yeah, I guess this sort of comes to a bit more of a fun wrap up um, and please feel free to interrupt at any point. But uh, I think it's always, especially when we're living in a world that's so focused on uh, new is better and, and, and how AI can assist rather than uh, potentially impede uh, new markets. Uh, I think we always like to ask, how can we do better? How will it change? And will AI and music ever go too far? Yeah, so I think um, for artists, when, when we talk to them about it, ironically, we tell them not to be afraid of the robots uh, because I think a lot of artists remain either skeptical or uh, sort of um, vindictive. I think not getting plays on Spotify and, and everything really psychologically plays takes a toll. So for artists, it's important to recognize that these tools aren't necessarily, um, you know, game changers for them or, or money makers as much as they are incredible marketing tools, especially for independent artists. Um, so embrace the robots, but focus more on the music. And I think for the industry, it's uh, tell the robots to shut up and, and focus more on the music. Um, or certainly get back to, again, why we all got into the industry in the first place, um, prioritizing the right data at the right time, which is music first. I mean, it, it just is. Um, I, I think that all feeds then into the answers because, again, what we've been harping on about in this talk and over the last while is, is the prioritization because it results in more diverse deals with diverse structures. It increases streaming revenue. It saves everyone time and money in one of the most laborious tasks in the music industry. And one of the only tasks in the music industry as well right now, especially with the whole world in lockdown. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's not only important, but it's, it's crucial right now to, to really start focusing on, on the right data. And um, I think that's why we've had such a big year. Absolutely. And I want to, I want to ask Korak, uh, will it go too far? Will so uh, a friend of mine, a, a former colleague of mine was giving an interview about that. And, uh, you know, they always asked it, this was more on like uh, AI uh, music generation, which is a very hot topic at the moment because Spotify are actually making, like they are, they are manufacturing their own artists. So they don't have to pay the, the meager little artist fee that they have to pay out. And if they could just pay that to themselves, uh, even better. But re related to like AI music and AI composition and uh, um, somebody from German television asked them, oh, like is AI music going, is AI music going to uh, replace composers? And my friend said, oh, that's only the bad ones. <laughs> Which I thought was quite funny. But uh, in all seriousness, uh, like obviously like it, there is a lot of hype around AI music at the moment. Um, uh, we, we should focus on the bits that work um, and uh, keep trying with the bits that aren't working so well. Um, mm. And just remember that like AI, AI music, the, the, the most exciting aspect of AI music is as, as you're saying, like it's just uh, help assisting us rather than replacing us. So assisting the human make better recommendations, assisting the humans compose music, uh, um, uh, in a better way, in a more creative way, in a more in a way that's more flowing, um, and not to be afraid of it. Absolutely, I think I think one of the things that we forget is zoom back hundreds of years, and people were afraid of different types of instruments, um, and then computers came along, and people cried out in horror that music was being destroyed, and now you have a generation of people who've produced music in their bedrooms that sell out multi-million dollar tours. So the idea that AI is going to go too far, I think, is 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 bogus. Um, it won't. It will change. Um, the idea that composers will become AI only is again bogus. There will be them. They will do. They will serve a purpose, but that's not going to remove a full sector of new upcoming classical composers. 
Um, and I think fundamentally, and maybe Zach, you want to touch on this bit as well. It's like ultimately the most powerful tool in the music industry is the human ear. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, again, it, it harkens back to the the right data at the right time. So just to to put it in perspective, if you go on uh, any of these tools, TikTok chart metric soda tone instrumental and say show me the artists that are trending in new york that have over a hundred thousand plays uh in the past week think about how massive that list could be then think about how vague it is you don't know the genre you don't know if they're signed you don't know what they're looking for you don't know if they actually have a market so it's all about shortening a list but using the passion of music to do that. So in that regard, you know what you listen to, you know if what you listen to is good, you know uh, if what you listen to is commercially viable, however you define commerciality within your sector. Um, and so to prioritize that, you just have to focus on the music because to do it any other way is perhaps to get more of a, a concrete idea that the artist will be successful but on the flip side you're sacrificing a lot of time and effort that could be completely rechanneled into other things absolutely but sorry just on, just on that sorry Neil, the, the whole point of ai isn't it to automate and save you time so will it go too far that's any industry with sure. who uses robotics yeah so absolutely. Absolutely. it's not a music thing it's a you know, how, you know, how much use do you want to use AI or, or BA oh, yeah. for? Look at, look at something as, as widespread and as, um, I guess we could call it normal uh, or, or grassroots uh, as auto manufacturing and what automation and AI has done both for the efficiency but also for job losses and things like that. So it is all about tempering the human element of it with automation and and not letting the robots take over right yeah and it's, it's yeah i always have to balance the, the people side of it but what you're trying to do is get get rid of the mundane tasks and push up the value chain exactly. which is the essence of what it was designed for again people will argue that it's doing too much of it but right. it, it, you know businesses are looking to streamline costs and Give, don't mind spending on quality. So if you're able to say, well, we can give you this part and you can spend extra on quality, is it's a value add then. Guys, uh, ju just a side question. Um, obviously, you understand the music very well. Um, but what about the impact of the music on, on a purchase decision, for example, in an advertising campaign or something like that? Has there been any research which is looking at the link between the music and the actual purchase decision on demographics and things like that? Or just a side note, just thinking about how you can monetize understanding music. Um, is that something someone's looking at in, in that area? Or? So I might let Cork touch on part of that, but um, Ryan, just to address the other part of it, one of our biggest bases uh, is the sync industry. Um, so we're working with currently the biggest sync provider in America. Um, and basically when you look for a sync, a music supervisor's job is exactly that. It's finding the music that will convey the message of the ad, which will then mm -hmm. convert it to a, a purchase. Um, so I don't know if Korhak, you know if there's actual sort of sentiment research being done, but certainly um, from a commercial standpoint, this has huge applications in sync because rather than saying something like i want a moody song in b flat uh, and again getting a huge list you can say i need a song like gimme shelter because i know what gimme shelter does uh viscerally but i can't afford the rolling stones so i can search yeah. for a song that scientifically sounds like gimme shelter uh, and undercut my costs but korak if you want to talk about research if you know of any um actually yeah there's a, well i mean there's a lot of there's a, a lot of hype in 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 um in music recommendations and music information retrieval at the moment um like trying to predict tags 
and trying to predict natural language um, aspects of music. Uh, and then there's a lot of like, there's a lot of research on combining that with like the, the preferences and the, and the likes that are generated. So like last event, for example, has a huge data set of likes um, and tags. So you can, you can imagine like the, 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 there's this enormous data set of uh, subjective preferences and subjective tag labeling um, that can be used for, for training models uh, regarding the monetization. Uh, don't ask me anything about that. I just punch information into the computer. So, um, yeah. Is any other questions, please? Uh, I'll leave this up for a bit. Um, you're, you guys are more than welcome to reach out. Um, I tend to head up operations, Zach CEO, and Cork's the head of our audio analysis department. So we'd be happy to continue any sort of questions you guys have. Um, and to the extent that you want to continue the conversation on socials, our hashtags imagine being heard, and our usernames are all at Anderson Music. So um, please feel free to connect. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks, thanks, Mill, for your time. Does anybody have questions? It's really interesting. Thanks, guys. Looks like great work. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks very much. Yeah, you've, you've been on the, an upward trend over the last few weeks. It's uh, exciting times for the business. Yeah, thanks. It should it should continue hopefully over over the new year. Um, yeah, no, it's uh, it's great to see, and it's it's a really interesting product. So, um, just just my one big question is, what was the? I I mentioned it earlier, but since you've got more traction, has there been positivity towards you, or is it people are still been a bit negative towards it, or has people really adopted it as norm? No, it's, it's, look, it's, we're still very much in that growth phase and to say otherwise would be, again, it would be naive or to be saying, saying something that's not true. Um, so we're still very much in depth uh, of, first of all, like next week is one of the most exciting weeks for me. First of all, now that we have that startup awards thing, it's going to be even busier, but um, we're going through a full rebuild um, of the platform. So one of the biggest pain points of our platform right now, and again, this is the whole platform versus API question, um, is our discover section. It's not, it's not robust enough. Um, and to say otherwise, again, would be a lie. So we're going through this full UX rebuild to build out better analytics um, beyond our audio analysis section, build out better recommendations outside of the audio search and to build a more robust um, discover section to give people more suggestions. Um, so Christmas uh, is coming in a couple of weeks, but it's going to be a very, very busy holiday season, especially for myself and Zach. Um, just going through that new platform build, which we're hoping to launch at the uploaded final in February. Um, so it's, it's continuous. Um, we only launch in June, so we're, we're, we're trying to be cognizant of that. Um, but we're also trying to look at the wins we have had. So we've had like, um, we had two sinks land on a podcast earlier this year in October, I believe. Um, we've had those artists collaborate, meet, having said that they wouldn't have met each other if they hadn't been on the platform. And we have early conversations now with some very large, large organizations who are interested in licensing our API. Um, so it's, it's, it's certainly too, too soon to say that right now we're the, the leader um, because we've only, been, um, we've only been active for a couple of months, but it's certainly our goal for the rest of the year, for the, for the rest of 2021 um, is to be that synonymous with digital a and &R. Um, and to be that respected source of audio analysis as well within the industry. Yeah. Brilliant. It's it, as I said, I, I won't take much much more time. Um, it's it's really exciting to see, and it's great that it's a, it's great to see it's been done in Ireland. And obviously, Zach is in New York, but we'll, we'll, we'll claim it. Um, no, thanks for your time, guys. Zach, Neil, uh, Cork. It was really interesting. Uh, we'll post a video, and um, anything else, we'll we'll tag you, and you can share away. Awesome. Amazing. Thanks for your time. Absolutely. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks, Thanks Mel. Talk to you, you. soon. Bye. Yeah.